I'd like to begin by asking how many of you may have been at my workshop yesterday? I see very few hands. There's going to be some overlap with the workshop, but as we progress in this uh, presentation, uh, there won't be. Can we try the lights one more time? I'm getting such a uh, glare right into my eyes. Maybe get a little more light in the, in the room. I, th I think that's better. Hello, my name is Paul Davids. I'm a film producer in Hollywood and a writer and director as well as a painter. I grew up near here in Bethesda, Maryland, and also uh, Garrett Park Estates, Kensington, and uh, had the uh, great fortune to have been able to have produced, as executive producer and co-writer, uh, one of the films that greatly influenced the way the public came to think about UFOs during the 1990s. I call this presentation Roswell, the making of the movie and the official reply, with a special emphasis on the official reply because as a sort of sociological phenomenon or experiment, I think one of the very interesting things that came of the movie was not just the public reaction but the official reaction the news media reaction, the onslaught of, uh, let's say, debunking that uh, came as a result of the production of this uh, film and the impact that it had uh, across the nation. Could I see a show of hands as to how many have seen the movie Roswell or saw it the other night? Good, most of you have, almost all of you have. I want to start at the beginning as to how and why uh, I became involved in that production uh, and let you know a little bit about my, my background. We've skipped one here. The previous uh, slide should have shown JFK's book, Profiles and Courage. I'm the son of a famous historian, Dr. Jules Davids who for 40 years taught at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service, who helped found the School of Foreign Service, and uh, who in the course of his career taught many students who went on to have great influence in American government and American policy. Early on uh, in the mid-50s, my father, who's shown at the right, typing on his manual typewriter, taught Jackie Kennedy in one of his classes at Georgetown. The photo at the right shows my dad's high school graduation picture. At the left, you see him from behind uh, with uh, Jackie Kennedy in his classroom. And through that association, through Jackie telling Jack about my dad's lectures in political courage, he came to be invited by John F. Kennedy to work on the writing of the book that became Profiles in Courage. This was the first letter that uh, John Kennedy as a senator sent to my dad, January 15th, 1955. I want to give you some of this background of my father's connections with two presidents, in part to help you understand my own motivation, my interest in American history and getting it right. Because as we summarize what you've heard at this conference in the last two days, as we summarize the things that you've been hearing that have probably not been spoken publicly like this in the Washington DC area before, it bears substantially on our own history, 
and whether a whole portion of that history has been completely blotted out for us in the name of secrecy and national security. It's a question that had uh, profound interest for me because I so respected my dad and I thought he got it right and he certainly never heard anything about uh, extraterrestrial contact, extraterrestrial crash recovery. Uh, his was what you might call an orthodox and a straight and scholarly version of American history. And that was in no way part of it at all. This was the, the handwritten letter uh, Senator Kennedy sent to my dad um, indicating that Ted Sorensen had told him it would be possible for my dad to arrange his schedule so that he could work on the preparation of the book. My dad had written a memorandum uh, about uh, several senators who showed great political courage. My dad felt the book should be restricted to examples of courage among senators. Kennedy says, I thought your memorandum was excellent and should prove most beneficial. I'll be in touch with you. Look forward to seeing you in April. I really wanted you to see the documentation because when someone comes before you and tells you that their dad really wrote the lion's share of profiles and courage for uh, the man who was soon to become President Kennedy, that's quite a claim. And uh, I want to show you that there's, uh, there's the paper trail <laughs> that uh, establishes that. This is the preface to Profiles and Courage. And uh, the third chapter down says, Professor Jules Davids of Georgetown assisted materially in the preparation of several chapters. Doesn't say what that, that meant. What it actually meant was that out of nine chapters in the book, my dad wrote the first draft for five of them. Four of them were on various senators. One was uh, an essay on the meaning of political courage. Walter Scott's personality parade years later, 1980, credits uh, Ted Sorensen and my father as having been the main ghostwriters of that book. Incidentally, it won a Pulitzer Prize, and it's contrary to the rules of the Pulitzer Prize Committee for an author to accept the Pulitzer Prize for a book that he hasn't written himself. And so Ted Sorensen said nothing to the contrary. Um, and uh, my dad said nothing to the contrary for a very, very long time. Uh, had he uh, spoken out to Drew Pearson, who called him during the 1960 election to ask for confirmation of rumors, uh, it might have derailed JFK's march to the uh, Democratic nomination. Here was another student of my father's, young Bill Clinton in 1968. And uh, this is important because I want you to understand the uh, personal connection my family had to Bill Clinton and the personal connection I uh, developed to the governor of Arkansas who became our president uh, and how it was that I came to write correspondence to him about UFOs and the Roswell incident that actually uh, got through to him at the White House. Uh, I left the East Coast. I wanted to be a film producer, had wanted to pursue that path from a very young age. I had always uh, been interested in special effects and animation. Uh, and when I was at first in uh, Hollywood, I worked for uh, the agent, Paul Koner. Uh, I was a script reader for all the projects for Charles Bronson uh, and John Huston. Uh, and I worked with William Wyler. Uh, that's when I met George Powell, who gave me my first break in writing out there to write a treatment for a movie on The Hobbit. In those days, no one in Hollywood was interested in Middle Earth except George Powell. And we were uh, turned down by every studio. So that project had to wait a long, long time before it became uh, the live action Lord of the Rings. Uh, I was also a segment producer on Lie Detector the F. Lee Bailey uh, syndicated television show. We did one episode on Betty Hill. Um, during the time leading up to my interest in UFOs, I was also production coordinator of the Transformers, the uh, daily cartoon show based on the Hasbro Bradley toys. I was production coordinator for 80 or more episodes that are all now out there on uh, DVD from Rhino, and I wrote a lot of them. And then after the Transformers, 
Then came February 25th, 1987 at 4.30 in the afternoon. I'm going to go quickly through this part because I want to get to the movie and its aftermath, but I want you to understand the reason UFOs came into my life as an interest was because one of them came into my life physically. At the left, on the cover of International UFO Reporter, you see the view from my roof that I saw that day. My daughter had screamed out to me that I should come upstairs, she could see a flying saucer. I was slow to respond. I thought, sure, it would be a good year blimp. And I was being interrupted again for no reason. Uh, but she screamed emphatically that it was a flying saucer. I had to get upstairs. It was still broad daylight. I ran into her room with my son, who was then six, looked out the window, and for the first time in my life, saw a flying saucer. They're real. It was a dome disc. It swooped down from uh, very high in the sky through the clouds. We walked out onto the roof and watched it. I saw it for around five minutes. It actually perched there and hovered in the air between the two front trees in front of our house and hovered there. Uh, it made maneuvers off to the left. There was a hole between the trees. Uh, and it took a position right in that space, that hole between the trees, so that there was eye contact between us and this object. That was the, the contact, if you will. Uh, it, it was an indication it was aware of us. We were aware of it. This swooped down across the valley. It disappeared. It was about the size, somewhere between the size of a Volkswagen and a helicopter. I'd seen helicopters over my valley. I think it was a little smaller than that, maybe a little larger than a Volkswagen car. Not enough for an abduction, I don't think. Uh, I don't know where it came from, who built it. I don't think Jet Propulsion Lab would have been testing one of these things over my neighborhood. But obviously, I don't know. All I can say is it shook me up, it opened up my eyes, that the dome disks that defy gravity um, that don't have uh, propellers or you know, work with jets or whatever. They're real, and I knew it from that moment on, and I wanted to find out everything about it that I possibly could. These were my notes from that day. It was perfectly silent, describing the path of it. And uh, this was a uh, drawing my son made, 4.30 in the afternoon, the wiggly lines he said, he was six years old, was trying to show that it had a little wobble to it when it was, uh, as my daughter said at that point, when it was hoovering. Um, here's my, my, my son who gave a description of what we saw in the interest of time. I, I won't dwell with this right now. I want to take you to other things in my report. This was my daughter's drawing. But you see, my my view of all of this changed that day, and I began to investigate uh, flying saucers, and I found in my readings that there had been a history of official denial of all evidence. I had not known this. It had not come to my attention. I was a victim of that 1950s Robertson Committee that began the suppression. I hadn't read the books. I hadn't seen the Walter Cronkite television show, none of it. I just thought it was all fiction. And I also saw, by studying the uh, history, that uh, there had been consistent debunking of all witness testimonies that had seemed so deliberate and so orchestrated and calculated. Um, I won't show these uh, clips. I have a couple of clips. I just will tell you, you know, I, I, I learned about the DC flap of 1952. I think you've heard a great deal about that if you've attended Bruce Maccabee's talk and some of the other talks here this weekend. I hadn't known that such a thing had taken place. I learned about swamp gas. J. Allen Hynek, who was honored here last night for his great contribution to ufology, uh, and it was because of his conversion that this conference honored him. He started out working for the Air Force as their, if you will, official explainer or debunker, and he came up with the swamp gas explanation for Michigan. As the years went on, his view of UFOs evolved and matured. He set up the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies. He came up with the concept of close encounters of the first, second, and third kind. And he came to the conclusion that uh, the UFOs were real. 
and the, re the reports of alien visitation should be taken very, very seriously and investigated very, very seriously. The Condon Committee. This was the cover-up, the whitewash, if you will, of uh, 1968. The official investigation that resulted from Congressman Gerald Ford's demand for an inquiry over the Michigan swamp gas uh, incident. And I, I do want you to see this clip. I want you to see a few of the, the key players who protested so vehemently when the Condon Committee conclusions came out and resulted in, number one, the shutting down of Project Blue Book. Number two, the National Academy of Sciences um, advising scientists throughout the country that now there was no further need to study this phenomenon. It had been uh, dispensed with through the uh, Condon inquiry at the University of Colorado. General Ford, who was congressman at the time and then president, of course, initiated the first congressional hearings that contained portions that were open to the public. I think the Congress wanted a fresh look into UFOs, an objective scientific investigation that would be completely independent of the Air Force. In charge was a physicist at the University of Colorado, Dr. Edward Condon. Many people had high hopes that this would finally be an in-depth, serious scientific study. But when the Condon report came out, the UFO community was outraged. We find this Condon report incredible. I would label as prejudiced. Really, it's a lot of nonsense. This report covers only about 3% of the evidence that was made available to them. There is a very large, uh, a very large, an overwhelming majority of the significant case material that has not even been confronted. It evades a number of cases in which the Air Force itself said there was no explanation. Dr. Condon and his group was given an unprecedented opportunity to clarify the UFO problem that's puzzled so many of us for a long time, he wasted that opportunity. The three men that you see there, uh, Saunders, who had been on the Condon Committee and resigned in protest over feeling that the conclusions were rigged. Uh, Donald Kehoe, Major Donald Kehoe, one of the first prominent and important writers of books about UFO reality. And Dr. James McDonald, for all of you who saw and Ruffles presentation, this was the scientist who is the focus of her book called Firestorm. Uh, he uh, committed suicide just a few years after this, after having been the object of tremendous ridicule by the scientific community and others for his interest in this subject matter. Part of the point of what I want to drive home today, where we're going with this, uh, was that the Making of the film Roswell and its broadcasting, in effect, resulted in the unleashing of a massive amount of additional ridicule. You're going to see some of that ridicule. Uh, some of it directed uh, at uh, Stanton Friedman, who was honored here last night, um, and um, uh, directed at many, many other people uh, connected with the investigation of the Roswell incident. Uh, and I'd like you to see just how forceful, how bitter, how angry, how deliberate, how desperate that uh, process of ridicule and debunking became. Um, let's take a look at one of the, uh, one of the uh, most famous of the debunkers, who's now just retired, uh, Philip Klass, is going to respond to this question to, um, I think that this is... Uh, Hickson, one of the early abductees uh, from a case in Pascagoula, Mississippi. I want you to see Philip Class. Do you have any notion why you were picked? Uh, no. No, not really. I guess I've asked myself that question. This is I'll Hickson of Hickson and Parker. Why me? It is, in my mind, a hoax. A hoax that's been perpetrated on the American public. Uh, the story is so fantastic, it almost challenges the, uh, one's uh, credulity. What challenges one's credulity? Philip Klass has written books accusing almost every uh, UFO case of the last 50 years as having been uh, either a hoax, a deliberate hoax, fraud, uh, or a uh, misidentification. 
of weather balloons, the planets Venus and Jupiter. He had a few other explanations in there too. Uh, early on after my sighting, I met Philip Klass. I had read one of his books and uh, I didn't know the spirit of the debunker at that point. I just thought that he was uh, uh, an intellectual, an aviation editor, a, uh, a skeptic who I felt was misguided because perhaps uh, he just hadn't heard it from somebody who really knew that they existed. And that's when I spoke to him and tried to straighten him out. <laughs> he spent the next, well, until he retired and just moved to Florida recently, he's been trying to straighten me out. I probably got 40 letters from him, 50 emails. He, he would send me uh, every few months a, a coupon, a clipping, an advertisement from a toy catalog showing helium balloons, showing uh, toy UFOs with propellers, which was his explanation for the craft that my children and I had seen. Do you have... Sorry, let's progress here. And so, my UFO sighting was uh, investigated by Donald Schmidt of the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies. He's shown at the right. He came out, he wrote a report about it, um, and uh, he introduced me to Captain Kevin Randall. This was back in, uh, he investigated in 87, the year that it happened, and in 1989, when he was in Los Angeles investigating the MJ-12 papers, he told me of the uh, book that he and Kevin Randall planned to write about Roswell. They were conducting their own investigation. At that time, they only had a 17-page outline. And they wanted to know if I was interested in trying to launch the movie. Well, you see from my background, I certainly was. Uh, I was interested in clarifying the history I felt from what I had seen that there was a, uh, it was very logical to me that something of the nature of what I had seen uh, had crashed in Roswell, New Mexico, had been recovered, and that that was the cause of uh, everything that had followed. So I was interested in um, making a stand uh, for the sake of, uh, of, of, of history, uh, the influence of my father on me. I was interested in it as a cinematic challenge. Uh, and I felt uh, driven to do what I could to educate the public on this subject since my mind was so very made up uh, that it, it was a real phenomenon, there were real craft, and that the public uh, was being deliberately uh, lied to. And so uh, for $25, I optioned the rights to their 17-page outline. Um, Promising, of course, that when I had to deal with the studio, they would be paid very fairly, but I held on to the rights for a couple of years, and it was years of rejection from every studio and production company in Hollywood. I still have the rejection letters and all the reasons that they told me um, it never would have ha it never happened, or they would have heard of it um, if it if they made such a movie and it was proven false, they'd have egg on their face. Uh, they didn't think anybody would be interested. No one would believe it. I mean, I was up against this wall of resistance for years. Um, I think I'm going to skip over a few things. I'm just going to tell you about, rather than show you these clips, uh, some of the uh, things that I impressed me about the likely reality. Um, I had come across the writing of, I think his name is Victor Marchetti, a former CIA official who had written a paper giving what he felt were the reasons for uh, the UFO secrecy and concern by the powers that be that the revelation could upset the, the, order, the social order and the power structure of the world. The same sort of things that were written in the Brookings Institute report that was covered in the last talk by Terry Hansen. Um, this was uh, the testimony of uh, Major Marcel, who was at the crash site, that so impressed me. The conclusion of the man who was there, who, who, who uh, had uh, said 30 years after the fact that there was a cover-up, uh, that he had been asked to withhold the truth, but that it wasn't made on Earth. This is short. I'm going to show it to you if I can manipulate. Here we go. 
What I saw, I couldn't believe there was so much of it. It was scattered over such a vast area. So we proceeded to pick up as much of the debris as we could, loaded in the wagon. It was not anything from this earth that I'm quite sure of. Because I was being an intelligence officer, I was familiar with just about every, all materials used in aircraft and in our air travel. This is nothing like that. Uh, in order to try to uh, squash the Roswell case during the years of debunking, this man's testimony had to be run over roughshod and he had to be discredited. Uh, that was a very, very uh, difficult thing for the debunkers uh, to do. I don't think they did it successfully uh, at all. He was the intelligence officer, the 509th bomb group, had the atomic bomb. He was promoted after this to the Pentagon. Uh, I'm not going to show this clip. I'll tell you about it. Uh, Sappho Henderson, the widow of Captain Pappy Henderson, who uh, had um, told his wife 30 years after the fact that uh, there were alien bodies recovered at Roswell, and he was the pilot that flew them to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, that the security was so high he hadn't told her for 30 years. Barry Goldwater. Are we okay for uh, for time? We th we're not. Okay. Okay. I you know I was just I was just able to start 20 minutes ago. Can I have 10 more minutes to wrap up? That's right. We're way behind. I really uh, I really need another 20 minutes to finish the presentation. Thank you very much. All right. The censorship has been lifted. <laughs> Barry Goldwater thought that the uh, weather balloon story about Roswell was very fishy. He was the Republican candidate for president against Lyndon Johnson, and uh, he had been thwarted in his own efforts to get to the bottom of it. This is part of what he had to say. Former U.S. Senator Barry Goldwater thinks there's something fishy about the whole story. As chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee and an Air Force general, Goldwater had a top secret security clearance. During a visit to Wright-Patterson Air Base in Ohio, he asked to view the hangar where the Roswell wreckage and other UFO information were reportedly stored. Permission was denied. Goldwater later wrote that he was told the matter was classified above top secret. He was also told to never ask again. Uh, there's a second uh, direct statement by Barry Goldwater that was on the was broadcast by Larry King in which he basically says the same thing. Uh, the Roswell movie, it, it began to have a chance when I brought in director Jeremy Kagan. We became uh, partners. He had directed The Chosen and The Journey of Natty Gan. He set up a deal at HBO. We were in development for a year and a half. They spent a few hundred thousand dollars in development, and then they dropped the project in order to do another UFO film that year, The Attack of the 50-Foot Woman remake. We had to go out and sell the project again to Showtime, which we did successfully, and we did get to make the movie. Finally, the, books, the book came out, UFO Crash at Roswell by Randall and Schmidt. The one at the left has some scenes from the uh, movie on the cover. The one at the right is a revised version they wrote later. Uh, you've all seen the movie. I, I will skip this. Uh, this was the preview that was released at the time. Uh, Congressman... Schiff began an investigation of the Roswell incident. He was from a Republican from New Mexico. He wanted uh, to, uh, to establish what it was that had crashed, and he asked for cooperation of the Pentagon. He got the runaround, and uh, after several attempts on his part, he asked the Government Accounting Office to investigate. The uh, Air Force then got involved in its own investigation to try to offer an answer since they saw the congressman was insisting on one. Our movie came out, and here are some of the other things that happened. That within uh, a year of our movie being broadcast on Showtime came the alien autopsy film, which uh, I can tell you I have zero confidence in as having any reality whatsoever. It, it, 
it may be based on a, you know a, a a real autopsy of aliens that did happen at that time, which none of us have seen yet. But this wasn't the film, and it really tended to cloud the whole Roswell incident for the public. It made it a joke. This was broadcast on Fox, alien autopsy, fact or fiction. Um, here was the announcement by Tom Brokaw um, that uh, it wasn't a saucer that crashed at Roswell. It was uh, a, uh, an experimental mogul balloon, which I'm quite convinced was a cover story. Uh, and here is what, what Tom Brokaw had to say that night. For those of you who believe in visitors from outer space, well, some discouraging news. When Nightly News continues in a moment, we'll have the space shuttle liftoff, and also, was it a cover-up of UFOs? The government says no way. And in the skies over the West Coast this morning, an unidentified speeding light and apparently a sonic boom. Many saw it, but there's been no official explanation. Well, maybe they should ask the Pentagon in, oh, about 47 years. NBC's Jim Mikloszewski tonight on the Air Force fessing up almost a half century after another UFO. Stories about UFOs and aliens swooping down from outer space have long captured our imagination. They call that true lies, the you Roswell see. Especially incident. 47 years ago, something crashed into the desert outside Roswell, New Mexico. And for 47 years, the Pentagon lied about it. Eyewitnesses had reported debris from a flying disc scattered over two-thirds of a mile. Some stories included the bodies of four-foot-tall aliens, crew members killed in the extraterrestrial crash. The Pentagon denied it was a UFO and claimed the debris came from a military weather balloon. But the Air Force now says it wasn't a weather balloon after all, but a top secret balloon to spy on the Soviets. That would appear to explain all the Pentagon's secrecy, right? Wrong. Oh my God. This thing they used big. scenes from our movie to As debunk the case. In a recent movie, several witnesses claim the military forced them to change their stories and hide the evidence. Walter Hott was an airman in Roswell at the time, and now runs a UFO museum. I think that their comments are simply another cover-up. Some UFO buffs believe the military covered it up to protect against public panic because they couldn't explain it. Perhaps alien and non-human, uh, something not made by any power on this earth. The government contends most UFO sightings can be explained, but out of the thousands reported over the years, one out of ten remains a mystery. As for Roswell, the case is not closed. The General Accounting Office will release its own report soon. The decision rests with you. Jim McLachewski, NBC News, Washington. Bill Clinton in Ireland made this statement about the, uh, the Roswell incident, but this wasn't his whole statement. What he, what he said in answer to a child's question was, uh, no, Ryan, as far as I know, a spaceship did not crash in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. But if it did, and alien bodies were recovered, the Air Force hasn't told me about it, and I would like to know. All the news media in the United States chopped the statement in half and only had the president say what you're going to see right now, which is followed by a laugh. And they followed it with um, some news from the Pentagon. As far as I know, an alien spacecraft did not crash in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. <laughs> this week, the Pentagon tried to put the whole issue to rest, saying reports of alien bodies in the desert were actually Air Force dummies used to test parachutes. The reports of military units that always seem to arrive shortly after a crash were actually accurate descriptions of Air Force personnel engaged in the dummy recovery operations. But that explanation hasn't ended the controversy. They must think we're the dummies to believe a story like that. Uh, it's probably the most preposterous of all the cover stories. Okay. Um, so now we had the crash dummy report. Uh, I had been writing to Bill Clinton and he had been writing to me, uh, here's his first letter to me in uh, 1992, February 12th, uh, I had 
expressed my family's support for his candidacy and told him about some Star Wars books I was writing. Um, I wrote him again after that, sent him the Star Wars books when they came out. He was president-elect when he wrote me this, December 9th, 1992, thanking me for the Star Wars books and a photo of my dad. And after he made that statement from Ireland saying, if it did happen, the Air Force hasn't told me about it, and I would like to know, I decided I would tell him what I knew. And I wrote a two-page letter to uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, I, I had a contact at the White House. I called. I found out how to be sure to get it right through to the president. I stapled all the previous correspondence uh, to it. Um, and in addition to my letter, I included uh, the movie Roswell and three uh, educational documentaries I had made about the issue, including my reply to the Air Force report on the Roswell incident, which uh, accused um, the report of being a, uh, a further cover-up. Um, and I sent him a copy of the book, uh, UFO Crash at Roswell, by Randall and Schmidt, and asked him to please consider declassification of this matter, since he had been leaning toward declassification on so many other things, and we, the public, had just gotten to hear some information about troop deployments in World War I in 1917, thanks to Bill Clinton's recent declassification. Um, I also sent him this. This was the uh, New York Daily News. It had the alien from our movie with Bill Clinton and Lawrence Rockefeller, who was then sponsoring a study of UFOs, which was later sent to all the members of the Senate and the Congress. About two months later, he sent me, the President sent me this letter back from the White House, marked personal, Thanks for the video cassettes. You were kind to pass them along, and I am grateful for your generosity and thoughtfulness. Hillary joins me in sending best wishes. There's no comments there about the Roswell incident or UFOs, but I was pleased that the President thanked me for sending him these seditious materials. I think that they caught his attention because when he was under impeachment, and the FBI went into the Oval Office and looked at the books on his private bookshelf. It was reported uh, that there were three books in particular that hit the news. Uh, it was uh, a book on phone sex. It was a gift from Hillary. No, no, not from Hillary. The other one. The mistress. <laughs> Monica. Um, alongside a book about Churchill. Uh, alongside UFO crash at Roswell. I'm, I'm sure that's the one that I sent him. So it got there, <laughs> and he was reading it. And he was asking Webster Hubble to find out the truth over at Jub Justice. Uh, we were building up to the 50th anniversary of the Roswell incident, which all of us in the UFO field felt could be a great occasion and a prelude to possible declassification and disclosure. Instead, the mood was set on March 26 when the Heaven's Gate fanatics, 39 of them, committed suicide, believing that, uh, or at least the news report was, that it had something to do with them thinking their souls would join a flying saucer behind the hale Bob comet. It was a disaster for the disclosure movement. It set us back horribly. The whole press campaign in the United States was, again, ostracizing anybody who believed in flying saucers. Uh, we all had a mental problem. That was kind of the mood in advance of the, uh, the 50th. And uh, you can hear it from his own lips. About to be recycled. Earth is about to be recycled. Your only chance to evacuate is to leave with us. I don't know if... Uh, Nobody knows the story behind that, but let me just say it was, it was very convenient for discrediting UFOs at a time that, uh, uh, that those who dismissed them officially uh, wanted them to be uh, dismissed. The news coverage of the 50th anniversary had two prominent themes, that Hollywood had kept this uh, legend alive, it was a legend, and that the celebration would be gold for the town of Roswell, which would be cashing in on it. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to run this news clip. Well, let's. This is a, okay. I'm going to show you this and just, just a couple of others because I know we're going to have to wrap up soon. Uh, this was indicative of the news at that time. Again, it used a clip from our movie to talk about uh, the Roswell incident. Uh, but it goes to those cash registers in Roswell. It goes to uh, all of those sales that were being made for souvenirs. 
community of Roswell, New Mexico kicks off a six-day out-of-this-world celebration 50 years after what for some is a still unexplained close encounter. NBC's George Lewis beamed over there for this report. Roswell, New Mexico has become one of the spaciest towns on the planet. There are extraterrestrials all over the place. And local institutions from this Mexican restaurant to a tire store to local hotels and motels and even one of the Roswell churches are trying to cash in on the flying saucer craze. And as the city begins its UFO festival, it's expecting 60,000 visitors from all over Earth. Frankie, scoot over your That prop was a donation from our movie. If you say to the festival folks, take me to your leader, they introduce you to Stan Crosby. There'll be 150 vendors in and around the convention center selling everything that's UFO and alien related. It's, uh, it's gonna be a great time. We've had people from Japan, France, Germany, England. All this worldwide attention because of something that supposedly happened half a century ago on land now owned by rancher Hub Corn. According to local legend, this is where the flying saucer so ran into the ground. Can you kind of point out where it supposedly crashed? Okay, basically right there where those two American flags are right there. This is not this the rancher's. Just moved! Hollywood has done its bit to keep the legend alive. In the movie Roswell, the crash is recreated. The Air Force finds that dead was my cameo role in the movie. This one just the moved. Of the spacecraft, and then hushes the whole thing up. Let's go on. They talk about Independence Day. They talk about all the money being made by the town of uh, Roswell. Um, here's what happened. Uh, this I, I want to show you a couple of clips. I want to show you the debunking of uh, of Stanton Friedman, uh, and I want to show you. Uh, Captain McAndrew, the man who came up with the crash dummy report, defending himself uh, against an onslaught by Sam Donaldson, who didn't believe his report. Uh, Sam Donaldson was a graduate of the Roswell uh, Military Academy. Uh, Dr. Nick, what's your thoughts about what happened in Roswell and what we've heard just now from Mr. Freeman? Well, I think a young information officer was of the ilk that uh, thought he should uh, get attention with whatever press release he put out. So he said when something crashed, he said, we've, we've captured one of the flying disks. He didn't know, what, he, he didn't know what it was. That's absolute nonsense. Just hold, just hold uh, on one second for me. Try to be get, try to get civil. You, we'll get you in, I promise uh, you. Go ahead. It's difficult Dr. Nichols, go ahead. You. Go ahead. Uh, and and uh, along comes, uh, years later, comes uh, Stanton Friedman, and, and he's done more to fan the flames of this nonsense uh, and bears the responsibility as much as any other person for this, uh, this constant uh, uh, bad-mouthing of the United States government, uh, this, this constant it. running down of the government uh, when there's not any evidence there. I mean, it was, in fact, a Project Mogul spy balloon. But if you look at the photographs, the photographs are, are exactly consistent with this kind of wreckage. It's foiled paper, sticks, and string. Pretty flimsy flying saucer. Now, Stanton Friedman, Who's, uh, who, who gives new meaning to the word positive. You know, Ambrose Beer said it was being, being uh, wrong at the top of your voice. And uh, Stanton Friedman, in, in this bravado, bruff, uh, rough way that he always does, tells people that he knows this and that. But he was snookered by the MJ-12 documents, a crude, paste-up forgery that I, that I could prove. In fact, I, in fact I, I have a background in document examining and have a new book, uh, Detecting Forgery, which debunks that. I can prove in a court of law they're fakes, and he has constructed an entire conspiracy scenario. All right, we, we, we see they broke in to say the NASA rover explored the surface of Mars. Let's go on. Well, I'm going to skip this clip, but what this one shows is that C.B. Moore, the head of the Project Mogul balloon experiment that the government used as its latest explanation, had a UFO sighting himself. He describes the UFO sighting in great detail, total mystery to him, investigated it, and uh, decided it was, it was an unknown, it was a UFO, and uh, the official response to his conclusion was that he had misidentified something conventional. He didn't know what he was talking about either. My proposition is that he didn't know what he was talking about when he said they recovered his balloon train, and that was uh, the explanation of the Roswell incident. Um, here we go. You will, you will love this. Kent Jeffrey, a, a, a Lockheed, I believe it was Lockheed pilot, who sponsored the Roswell initiative, getting, 
I don't know, 50,000 signatures or more for people requesting declassification. Suddenly, just before he was ready to mail these to the president to ask for declassification on behalf of these people, suddenly decided that it, it was a project mogul after all. Didn't send the, uh, uh, the uh, signatures onto the White House and instead went on Nightline to become a debunker. And here's what he had to say. When we come back, we'll be joined by a true believer and by an avowed skeptic of the Roswell incident. He's now a devout skeptic. But when I've talked to the provost marshal for the 509th bomb group, Major Edwin Easley, who retired as a colonel, and he tells me the craft is extraterrestrial, I find that to be very compelling evidence. This man had no reason to lie to me. He had no reason to make this up. He was not seeking the spotlight. He did not come forward with the truth. I searched him out based on looking at the documentation of who was at Roswell in the late 1940s and who had been in what positions to try to find people who could either corroborate the story of an alien spacecraft or who would corroborate the idea that something terrestrial crashed here that had been misidentified. I spoke with the men of the 509th bomb group talking to 15 B-29 pilots and two navigators who were there in 1947 and they regard this entire matter as complete nonsense. They were a very close-knit group, the only atomic bomb group in the world and they are emphatic that if something as dramatic as the crash of an alien spaceship had occurred at their base and the material was uh, recovered and, and flown through their base, they would have known about it. The, the, the answer to that is uh, Brigadier General Thomas J. DuBose was, has told uh, people on videotape that they were ordered by SAC headquarters not to talk about this. And if you get orders from a general telling you not to speak about something, you do not do so. So the fact that he's found people that don't know anything about it is really irrelevant. We've got to look for the entire group. Ted, I have a sworn statement from three men who spent 17 years collectively at the Foreign Technology Division at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base where this craft has supposedly been kept. These men have put their honor and their reputations on the line historically and signed a statement here saying by their word of honor no yeah. such ship no such secret you hangar may, was there you may they have well, gone on record you may as well put it down because all i can see is a sheet of paper with some print on it and, and, and that that in and of itself uh, i i take your point but i promised mr randall he'd get the last word mr randall you're gonna get the last word this is it I have an equal number of high-ranking individuals who are involved in the case who have also gone on the record and put their reputations on the line, and I think my two colonels and Brigadier General Trump, Kent, Jeffries, three colonels. No, I have a four-star general who was the base operations officer in 1947, Gentlemen, and I, he I, states I, unequivocally, no crash flying saucer. I got a full house. We're out of time. We don't have time to hear uh, all of this next interaction. Uh, but I want you to hear it, uh, 60 seconds of it uh, before we, we wrap up. This is the man who wrote the crash dummy report, as well as the mogul balloon. He was a captain in the Air Force uh, when he undertook that assignment. With us now is Mr. Jim McAndrew, who as an Air Force reservist, your rank as a captain, recently researched and wrote that report that Colonel Haynes relied on. Welcome, nice to see you. Thank you. Mr. McAndrew, <laughs> You, you say it was a weather balloon, but the first Air Force officer on the scene, who clearly must have had some experience with things like weather balloons, said, hey, this is a UFO, this is a flying disc. Well, the other Air Force officer on the scene who's still alive said it wasn't. Oh, we had a difference of opinion right there. Tell us what your theory is. What was it? I think we've had a, a series of events uh, brought together over the years, and now we have a, a large uh, myth which is developed from it. It was a weather balloon. What about the little it, it, was, it actually was never a weather balloon. It was a high-altitude research balloon. It was actually the very first one ever flown in New Mexico. Well, we don't have time for all of this, but let me tell you, he goes on for uh, six minutes, and uh, I think what he had to say was about as credible as this, our last clip, and then I'll say goodnight. Uh, this is the famous nothing-to-hide-at-all clip from the mid-1950s. Air Force had no conventional explanations, and no matter what they said, people didn't believe them. The Air Force has been accused from time to time of hiding information about UFO. What do you have to say to that kind of thing? Well, these charges are absolutely untrue. Actually, the United States Air Force releases statistics on the UFO phenomena through the Department of Defense press desk periodically, and we've always honored accredited media when they want to investigate a given specific sighting. 
There is nothing to hide. There is nothing to hide at all. Nothing to hide at all. And my uh, closing words to you and my summation for uh, this conference is that uh, as the uh, as the son of a historian who wrote about profiles in American courage, courage that comes along uh, once in a rare while in the Senate, I'm asking for a little courage. Is there someone here in Washington, D.C., who can stand up and begin to talk the truth about this incident? And in the meantime, while I'm waiting, I'll be back in Los Angeles. Thanks.